My name is Dr. Charles Wentworth. I conduct research in the field of physiology. The story you are about to see involves some facts about physiology, but it is more than a clinical report. It is a story that revolves around two seemingly unrelated articles, a good luck charm and an ordinary hypodermic syringe. In conducting some of my experiments, it is filled with a colorless inflammable fluid with a characteristic odor and a pungent taste. Chemical formula, C2H5. You know it as alcohol. My research is devoted to alcohol and its effects on the human body. But not all experimenting is done in laboratories such as this. A certain amount of experimentation goes on under less scientific conditions. Jerry Landon is one such experimenter. Jerry Landon, home from college for a vacation of fun and relaxation. After a while, well, we make bets. See, the guy that can tread the needle first after the most beers wins. And so who did? Well, you think it. he'd tell us if he didn't? Well, <laughs> you asked me what effect beer has, and I told you, on me, none. Jerry Landon is one of the types who experiments with drinking, the all-out type. Keith Stevens, on the other hand, is much more conservative. Hey, Keith, how would you and Mary like to go out to the lake tomorrow? What time? Early? Take a steak. Make a day of it. Think it over. Like to? Oh, Keith, I can't. I promise. Promised your mother you'd do something or another. How'd you know? Because you like to plan everything in advance. Nothing spur of the moment. Am I that bad? I didn't say it was bad. Just different from me, I guess. I like to let things take their course. What do you have? Beer? The Coke's all right. Coke and a beer. Uh -huh. Now there, I'll bet you planned that answer. If I was going to have beer, you were going to have a Coke, right? Well, maybe, but not just to be different. I plan not to drink because I plan not to drink. Hi. Hi. Made up your mind about tomorrow yet? Yeah, I'll go. Stag. His girl's got to be different. Same for you? I'll have a ginger ale. Me too. See, I'm not so different. Holy smokes, Dan, here I go, building her up that she's being somebody different. Then you have to go order ginger ale. What gives? Here's what gives. The one and only car in the Parker family is in my keeping. And there's a rule of the house. No drinking and driving. Not even beer. Not even water. Ginger ale. <laughs> Let me see. My car keys? No, oh. the charm. Now, wait a minute. That's my lucky piece. It got me through history last term, and I'm counting on it to graduate me. <laughs> Couldn't I trade you out of it? It looks to me like you have enough charm. It's not the bracelet he's referring to. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't have any like this one. <laughs> what do you say, Bev? Protect me. You better let her have it. She's got that collector's gleam in her eye. <laughs> Well, there goes my luck. If I flunk out next year... It won't be because little Edie didn't plan it. She's a great little schemer. Hmm? How about another round? Not now. Oh. I think we better dance. That's two. Yeah. Come on, huh? <laughs> Big dance. <laughs> I guess that leaves you, Jerry. Hold down the fort. The evening slipped pleasantly away for the three young men and their dates. For Keith Stevens, who did some drinking, for Jerry Landon, who held down the fort, and for Dan Parker, who stuck to ginger ale. Here in the laboratory, we've devised some scientific methods to determine what effects Keith and Jerry might reasonably expect from their haphazard experiments with alcohol. We use test animals with definite amounts of alcohol. This animal has no alcohol in its system. You might compare it to a ginger ale drinker. This is an animal which has previously been injected with only enough alcohol 
to bring the level in its blood up to what it would be in a human being after drinking four beers. The third animal has received enough alcohol to bring its blood alcohol level up to a percentage comparable to that of heavy indulgence. Say, someone who had been holding down the fort all evening. What's the first one? The one without alcohol. His reflexes are fast and automatic. He immediately copes with the unusual situation. In number two, with a moderate amount of alcohol, his coordination seems to take more effort. He meets the unexpected situation less skillfully. There's a perceptible decrease in his ability to balance. His reflexes are impaired. Now let's look at the third, the one well under the influence of alcohol. He meets the situation in a completely befuddled state. Note the complete inability to balance. This one is just not fit to cope with the situation, yet he can walk away. Test animals aren't alone in showing these reactions. Let's take a walk over to a classroom where human reactions are being tested. Now let's see what would happen when driving under the influence of alcohol. To find out, we use the Aetna Driver Trainer. A unique teaching device with real car controls, the driver trainer employs a series of special instructional films to present actual on-the-road driving conditions shown on a screen. The drivers of these individual classroom cars have a driver's eye view of this motion picture highway. Let's imagine you're driving and haven't taken alcohol. Watch out for that delivery man. Your rapid perception of the situation and quick brake reaction prevented what could have been a fatal accident. Now let's suppose you had done some drinking and are driving down the same road. You're driving a little too fast and have a false sense of confidence. Watch it. A few more feet might have meant tragedy. This time let's imagine you're fully under the influence. Reflexes are slow, judgment poor, and you're too late and too slow to avoid hitting the delivery man. Your confidence was high, but your reactions and judgment were low. Yes, like animal number three here, when you're under the influence of alcohol, you keep on trying. You keep on thinking you can. Your coordination is low, but your confidence may be high. Certainly, Jerry Landon's confidence was high. I could do it, and you ain't seen nothing yet. Jerry in front of an audience may be able to perform satisfactorily, but when he's alone and driving, he lets down and loses his concern, and therefore the safety factor. Right home. Oh, sure, Edie. Let's see, we have to take Bill and Rita, and that's pretty far out. She'll be another half an hour late. Mm, and I promised Mother I'd be home early. Why don't you just patch things up with Jerry? I can't. He's gone already. Mm. Besides, I didn't want to ride with Jerry. He had too much to drink. Jerry's gone by himself? Gosh, he was kind of under the weather. Well, I didn't want him to go alone. I tried to get him to let me drive. You know, that worries me. 
Bev, you think I ought to go after him, see if he makes it home all right? Well, somebody ought to. I wish somebody would. But we've got to take Bill and Rita and Edie here. Well, if you go looking for Jerry, you'll never get home tonight. Something wrong here? Jerry's gone on home. And in his condition, we think somebody ought to catch up with him to make sure he gets there. And Edie's stranded. Well, we can go after him and we can take Edie with us. Uh, I think I might stay here and go with Dan. But I don't know if Bill and Rita are ready to go yet. Well, I'll go get the coats. I wish you two were ready to go. Keith's been drinking too. Well, I don't think he's been drinking that much. I mean, enough to hurt anything. What do you think? I think it's all right. I'm not afraid to go with him. Well... Look, I can take you home now and come back for Bill and Rita. Well, that would be an awful lot of trouble. Maybe I better just call Mother and tell her I'll be late. Oh, come on and go with us. Besides, you'll make Keith mad by insinuating he's drunk. I guess so. Well, all right, fine. Here are your coats. Thank you. Now, you drive carefully tonight, please. Okay. Okay. You've made up your mind. Well, Keith, take it easy. Okay. Sure hope you find Jerry all right. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Somewhere a drunken driver was behind the wheel. But by the time Dan and Bev had taken the other couple home, they felt much less apprehensive. They supposed Keith had caught up with Jerry in time. And then... Oh, what is it? Looks like an accident. You don't suppose it was Jerry? Keith should have been able to catch him by now. You wait here. I'll go see if I can help. Jerry. No, not Jerry. Someone in the crowd up there had seen the state patrol stop a car that was weaving. But that was before the accident. I asked about it. The description fits Jerry's car. I guess he's safe. The police took him on in. Oh, thank heavens. For a minute there, I thought it was Jerry. What's that you got there? My good luck piece, the one I gave Edie. She didn't want to ride with Keith. With Keith? I found it up there at the side of the road. Why didn't she stick to her guns? Why didn't she insist on riding with us? Why'd I let her go off with someone who'd been drinking? But Keith wasn't drunk? No, Keith wasn't drunk. No, Keith wasn't drunk the way Jerry was. Had he been, the police might have picked him up, too. But Keith had just enough alcohol to slow his reactions in a critical moment. A moment that was to send him and Mary and Edie to the hospital. I know one thing. You can't trust to luck. If the driver's been drinking, you've got to stick to your guns and turn down the ride. Always. Always.